Do you believe in ghosts? Have you ever had an experience where you weren't quite sure what you saw? Or maybe even experienced something physical that you couldn't explain? The world is full of stories and claims about the paranormal. From anecdotes you might find amongst friends, or somewhere on a web forum like Reddit. There's also no shortage of TV shows like Ghost Hunters or Paranormal Lockdown and the all-time great Coast to Coast AM radio station. For this October episode of Lore and Legends, I wanted to take a look at a ghost story, one from my home state of Kansas that involves just about everything you could think of when you think of a haunting. From flickering lights to cold spots, apparitions, and even physical harm. For this episode, you'll definitely want to check out the link in the episode description to loreandlegends.net to follow up. The haunting I am referring to is known as the Sally House Haunting in Atchison, Kansas. What follows are what I felt like were the main events as described and written down by the couple who lived through them, with as little filler as possible. So listen to this and decide for yourself what to believe. Tony and Deborah Pickman got married and got pregnant in early January 1993. So they, of course, needed somewhere with a little more space. So they began looking for a house, and they found one in Atchison, Kansas. It was vacant, but had a rough exterior, built sometime in the late 1800s. But it wasn't long after that, Valentine's Day, 1993, that they began to notice dimming lights in the living room as they sat on the couch. This would last for four to five minutes at a time, and sometimes happened several times in a row. Was it some kind of fluke? They didn't have a dimmer switch. They even changed the lights. They checked the outlets, the switches. They even hired an electrician. Tony began to joke about a ghost, but little did he know. The dog would also bark at the still empty nursery upstairs, and it would bark in a threatening way and refuse to enter the room for the first few weeks. They also noticed strange cold spots in unusual places. This house didn't have a central air conditioning unit, just a window unit in the upstairs bedroom. In the spring of 1993, as Deborah was in her third trimester of pregnancy, there was one night where they were sleeping on the living room couch. Hearing a loud scream and thumping upstairs in the house, Deborah woke up screaming at 3 a.m. She felt like something heavy hit her back down into the bed, which in turn woke up Tony, who also began screaming. But then, realizing that nothing was happening, they decided to just blame the cats that they had. The cats did seem alarmed and agitated. They also noticed that the entire upstairs of the house was very cool. Cooler than the outside air, which was unusual for this time of year. Then, in June of 1993, about a week before the due date, Deborah noticed that the digital kitchen timer began acting up. She would set it for 12 minutes, but then it would change on its own to four minutes, and then up to 14 minutes. She wrote it off. But then the next day, while in the living room, the oven timer started buzzing. She went to the kitchen, and it stopped buzzing on its own. The next day, this would happen again. She would shut it off, and then it would go off again. This would continue until she finally just gave up. The buzzer would go off when they had guests, and somebody suggested that they disable it. Tony agreed, but then the buzzer stopped malfunctioning altogether. Their son Taylor was born in late June. Afterwards, while Deborah was painting the nursery, she was on the phone, and then the phone would die completely, so she would go and look for the other phone, and then the phone she was on would suddenly start working again. This happened a few times, but there were no problems before or after that. Their newborn baby also seemed to have an especially hard time sleeping in the crib. This not only stressed out the baby, but it stressed out Deborah and Tony as well. Running out of ideas, Deborah's sister Karen from New York offered to fly in and help them, an arrangement that they quickly agreed to. Then one day, prior to Karen's arrival, Tony was cleaning the nursery alone, and he noticed that the mobile above the crib started moving and playing music on its own. He told Deborah, but Deborah thought that he meant the baby monitor, 
which was noise activated, and that maybe the vacuum had set it off. That's not really what Tony meant, of course, so they argued. Tony ultimately went back to the room, but then it dawned on Deborah that he really did mean the mobile, which, of course, shouldn't move on its own. Deborah's sister Karen arrived from New York in July of 1993 and began watching the baby at night for them. They slept in the living room, where baby Taylor would sleep soundly with Karen. One day, Tony and his brother George were bringing a dresser home for the nursery. While putting it in the room, the mobile again began moving and playing music. On July 25th, Karen's last day in town, they were visiting with Tony's family. Tony's sister-in-law Jan arrived to the gathering, but seemed very anxious. She quickly pulled Tony and Deborah aside and told them that she had let herself into their house to drop off an old high chair. She visited the nursery as well, and she felt guilty about that. When they arrived home later that night, around 10 o'clock, Tony went upstairs to use the bathroom. When he came back down, he asked Deborah why she had moved all of the stuffed animals in the nursery onto the floor. Deborah was confused by this. They had several stuffed animals around the room, but they were all on shelves, and there was a teddy bear that was kept on a chair. So they went upstairs to look, and Karen went with them. The animals were all in the center of the room, arranged in a circle, with their backs facing each other. They ultimately assumed that it must have been Tony's brother George, or perhaps Jan, who had let herself in the house earlier, playing a joke. Deborah called Jan, but she didn't mention the stuffed animals, just made small talk and thanked her for the chair. But then she did ask if she noticed anything weird in the nursery, and asked if she had moved the stuffed animals. Jan seemed surprised at this. She didn't notice anything weird, and she didn't move the animals. But Jan did tell her that she had felt weird and uneasy in the house, cold on the stairs, and it kind of freaked her out a little bit. She didn't mention this earlier because she didn't want to come off weird, but this made her feel like she should mention the fact that she went inside. Deborah told this to Tony and Karen, and subconsciously, they all started thinking about ghosts. But ultimately, they settled for blaming Tony's brother, George. They put the animals back, and Tony turned off the lights. They all went downstairs. Once downstairs, Karen noticed that the nursery light had turned back on. So they went back to the stairs, and they all saw that the light was back on. So cautiously, they went back upstairs. Now scared, they find the teddy bear from the chair is back in the middle of the room, on the floor. Now all scared, they agree to stay together. They looked for strings, magnets, wires, anything that could have moved the bear and just been part of a practical joke. They put the bear back on the chair and left the room again. As they all left the room, they felt a sudden chill. Worried maybe somebody was in the house, they searched and found nothing. They went back downstairs, wondering who or what to blame, thinking about the possibility of ghosts. At about 10.50 p.m., Deborah needed to go upstairs to use the bathroom, but she was a little unnerved, so she asked the other two to wait outside in the hallway for her. Deborah peeked into the nursery on her way, and the bear was in the middle of the floor again. So they all went back into the room, searched again, this time even under the carpets, for magnets, string, and they found nothing, and they were truly perplexed. Then, at about 11.20 p.m., Tony called his brother Joseph and wanted him to come over and offer his opinion, and to check things out again and to be objective. Joseph reluctantly agreed, thinking that this was just an elaborate joke. But he did come over. Joseph suggests putting the bear back as they did before, and coming downstairs, taking an extra look to rule out pranks. They check the room periodically, and nothing changes. Joseph suggested putting the animal back into the original circle, so they did, and again, nothing happened. Deborah whispered while checking on the room, It's okay, you can play now. Then they returned downstairs. 
and Tony noticed that the teddy bear, near the TV in the living room, which was about a foot tall and weighed about a pound, was now facing the wall when it had been facing the room. Joseph believed this was all a prank, and that they had called him out there just to play a joke, which of course they all denied. So Joseph returned the bear to its original position. Joseph didn't know what was going on, but he could see that everyone was visibly shaken. He recalls that his boss's sister was actually a psychic, and agreed to reach out to her. And then Joseph left. Tony called his mother and described the events. And Tony's mother offers to let them stay the night at her house. Tony said that if it happens again, they will. They all decided that they would lock themselves in the master bedroom to sleep. They notice a stuffed toy heart with a teddy bear on it that was hanging on the doorknob had been turned around. This was about 1.30 a.m. Now locked in the room, they realize they can't sleep and have nothing to do. Karen and Tony went back downstairs to get the TV and the VCR. Karen set up a video camera that she had in the living room, but she forgot to turn it on. As they came up the stairs, Tony saw the bear on the TV stand in the living room turn around and face the wall. Oh shit, he said, and then they sprinted for the bedroom. It turns out that two of the random movies that they had grabbed ended up being horror movies. But thankfully the third was a comedy, so they all watched that and fell asleep. July 26th, the very next day, Tony got up and left for work. Deborah and Karen set to finish packing Karen's bag. They laughed at how silly everyone must think they are for creating such a panic so late into the night. Karen went to get her video camera, but she noticed that the viewfinder had been moved. She assumed it was Tony, but realizes that the power is in standby mode, implying that it had just been messed with. Since when in standby mode, it usually powered itself down within a few minutes if not being used. Deborah took Karen to the airport and came home alone and apprehensive. But she kind of wished that something would happen to prove that it was all real. Tony got home from work unusually late that day. He told Deborah that he had stopped by his parents' house. His mother was curious about the events of the previous night, and she had actually reached out to the mother of the previous tenant of the house. The woman called her daughter, who now lived in another state. She in turn called Tony's mom and reported that she remembered odd odors and that her son resided in the room that was now the nursery. He was always in trouble for not picking up his toys, but he'd always deny getting them all out. Her daughter in the next room had had an imaginary friend named Sally and would spend much of her time playing in the closet. She had never mentioned Sally again after moving from the house. The woman never chalked any of this up to anything beyond the fibs and musings of small children. Then, Tony's brother Joseph called back and said that his boss had heard from his sister Barbara, who was the psychic that he had mentioned earlier. Telling her all that they knew of the situation, Barbara relayed that it sounded like they had the spirit of a little girl in the house, playing with toys as if they were her own, and feeling perhaps drawn to the baby. What's more, the spirit likely felt comfortable around them for whatever reason. She also suggested that their baby Taylor could probably see her, and asked if the baby had had trouble sleeping. Barbara gave them what might seem like an unusual suggestion. She told them that they should tell the spirit that it was welcome, but that if it was going to stay there, it would have to follow their rules. She even mentioned the name Sally, which was even more unusual since that was the same name given to them by the previous tenant's daughter. Deborah was now convinced of the ghost presence, which had been weighing on her mind. And as they went to bed that night, questions raced through their mind, and Tony froze before turning out the light. Do you see anything weird? He said. And they noticed that a picture of them in the hallway by the stairs was now hanging upside down. The next evening... July 27th, 1993, Tony's brother George came over to visit. They recounted the events of the previous days, and they showed him again the nursery and the bears that had moved. George didn't believe them, 
until Tony jokingly picked up a 35mm camera and shouted, Sally, if you're here, say cheese. And just as the shutter clicked, George saw the bear by the TV move. Oh my god, it moved. The goddamn thing just moved. Instinctively, Tony turned to run upstairs to his wife and newborn son. George's legs wouldn't budge, struggling to breathe and telling Tony, Man, I can't move. He felt a rush of coldness go through him. Eventually, he regained control, and they ran upstairs and burst into the bedroom. A surprised Deborah thought at first that they were just horsing around, and then realized that they were in terror. They recounted the story to Deborah, and Tony decided that they should all leave the house. George ran outside, and Tony and Deborah hurriedly grabbed the baby supplies they would need before loading into the car. As Tony got the baby settled in, he grimaced and yelled, Ow! Damn it! And at the same moment, Deborah felt a cold, almost electrical sensation pass through her. What's wrong? she asked Tony. I feel like something bit me, he said. They arrived at Tony's parents and recounted the story. Remembering Tony's ow in the car, Deborah looked under his shirt and gasped. He had three long, bleeding scratch marks under his shirt. Could it have been the ghost? They photographed the scratches. They again reached out to Barbara and recounted all of the events. Barbara was convinced that they still didn't need to be worried, and she felt that the little girl was perhaps being protective of the baby, and likely misread Tony's intense emotions around the baby as harmful. Barbara reiterated that they needed to lay down some house rules with this entity she called Sally. So they returned home and did just that. Deborah told Sally that they needed to talk, and then began laying out the rules, as Deborah talked to an empty room, Tony wondered if they had gone completely crazy. They noticed that the cats were fixated on something in the air in the room. They also noticed a peculiar movement of the chains on the ceiling fan, and an odd staring by baby Taylor. Was Sally really there, they wondered? Deborah decided to leave a box of crayons and a paper for Sally as a goodwill gesture, and she had the idea to write down, How old are you? on one sheet, and then she left the room. Barbara called them back and said that she would actually be nearby in Kansas City the next day for a radio station interview, and she offered to come by the house if they were okay with it. Barbara was very interested in Sally. The Pickmans agreed. July 28, 1993. After Tony left for work, George returned with a friend who was interested in researching the history of the house and offered to help look in the library for any information. They discovered that the house was built in 1872 and belonged to the Finney family, who owned it and some of the surrounding property until 1946. The last Finney to own the land was a doctor. In 1958, the land was sold to two women, who owned it until 1992 before selling it to Les Smith whom the Pickmans were renting from. They also searched church records and birth and death records for children who may have died in the house. They found three Sallies, who each died between 1865 and 1905. Of the three, Sally Hall lived just around the corner from the Finney house and died in 1905. Could the ghost of one of these girls be lingering? On July 29, 1993, while waiting for Barbara to arrive, Deborah visited with her neighbor Carol, and thought to ask her if she'd noticed anything strange with the previous owners. Carol didn't really have anything to offer, but did ask Deborah why they always left the nursery light on every night. They didn't, Deborah replied, but they did leave on a light in the hallway. Carol insisted that it was the light in the nursery, as they could see it through the window from their house. So, was Sally perhaps keeping the baby awake with the lights? After returning home, Tony's brother George arrived to do some laundry and asked about the upcoming visit. After chatting for a while, George got up to check on his laundry and noticed that two typically decorative candles had been lit in the bathroom. Deborah never lit these candles, and they assumed that it must have been Sally. Deborah put the candles out and scolded Sally, just as Barbara had earlier suggested hoping that this would be the first and last time that a fire would be lit. Shortly after, two of George's friends arrived, 
aware of the previous events and curious about the coming psychic visit. As they waited, they decided to play with a new Polaroid camera that they had picked up. Deborah thought that since Sally was drawn to the baby, they should take turns holding the baby and see if anything weird would occur in the pictures. Sure enough, when the baby was in the arms of the new arrivals, he began to fuss, and the picture showed an eerie pale blotch between them and the baby. In all, they took 13 photos across two rolls of film to rule out some problem with the film or the camera. Eight of the pictures came out with white blurs, and all eight were situations in which the baby was unattended, upset, or in the arms of one of the strangers. Barbara arrived at 8.30 p.m. that night and could immediately feel the presence weighing on her. Barbara soon communicated that Sally was irritated with Deborah and Tony. She didn't like the new rules and said that they were too bossy. But Barbara added that Sally said that she was only seven years old. And after all, what child is ever happy about rules? Sally was more fond of Deborah than Tony, recognizing that Deborah was the baby's mother. Barbara suggested that Sally may have been abused or mistreated by a man in her past, and she was protective of the baby, particularly when it came to Tony and other strangers. Sally had likely made her presence known when Deborah's sister was in town because she was competing for attention. Sally also would not leave the house, as that was where she felt comfortable and safe. Barbara suggested that they get Sally some things to call her own, and leave them in the nursery, since that was where she spent most of her time. They all went up to the nursery, and Barbara felt the presence as strong as ever, and claimed she could see Sally in the corner. But Sally did not like all the people in the room, so Barbara ordered them out. Before Barbara left, she was also able to determine that Sally might not be the entity's real name, but was just one that she was comfortable with, and that she could come and go at her will. After Barbara left, Tony invited his parents to come over and discuss the meeting and George went to fetch Carol and Dawn, the two neighbors. When Tony's parents arrived, they repeated the camera experiment with different people holding the baby and got the same results. Carol and Dan arrived later with some old dolls to donate to Sally. Tony and George went to take the dolls upstairs and found that the teddy bear had once again moved. Deborah rushed upstairs and saw it for herself. She also noticed that on the sheet of paper she had asked Sally to write how old she was, she had scribbled the number seven in red crayon, with the word like behind it. But despite repeated attempts, Sally would never again write back. Over the coming days, Deborah collected a few more toys for the ghost, and would frequently find them moved around the room. On August 14th, 1993, George was staying at Tony and Deborah's house, and he fell asleep on the couch, only to be awakened by something heavy hitting him in the chest. Reaching out instinctively for a cat, George was shocked to find the beanbag teddy bear that had been on the TV stand laying on his chest. Big events began to slow down after this, with a spattering of the usual sorts of cool drafts and flickering lights, until October 1993. Tony told Deborah that for about a week, he at times could feel someone lightly biting his toes while he sat or laid down. Deborah thought it was mildly amusing, but Tony was not pleased. When Deborah got up to go upstairs, Tony shouted, Ow! And it seemed that Sally had managed to bite Tony hard on the leg, leaving a bite mark and a bruise. A few days later, the candles would once again be found lit. On Halloween that year, Tony got up in the morning and headed downstairs to get a glass of orange juice. Just as he'd filled his glass and was about to take a drink, he froze. There... Standing in front of him was a small girl, about three and a half feet tall, with blue eyes and a surprised expression. He dropped the glass, and it shattered on the floor. He looked down at the glass reflexively, and when he looked back up, the girl was gone. In December 1993, during a Christmas party at their house, Tony's brother George was walking by the stairs, and he stopped wide-eyed. Tony noticed and went to look, and there was one of Sally's dolls, on fire, on about the fifth step. Tony had seen the doll on the stairs earlier and thought nothing of it, but now that it was on fire, he quickly ran and grabbed it, burning his arms in the process before extinguishing the flames in the bathroom. Perhaps Sally was upset about not getting to visit Santa at the party. 
During this time, Deborah had continued to take pictures, hoping to catch glimpses of Sally. But she now began to notice that two separate blotchy entities would be present in some of the pictures. Was it really Sally who had been responsible for the increasingly hostile acts such as the fire? Not even Tony thought so at this point. In January 1994, Tony awoke one night, frightened and feeling as if someone was in the room. He awoke Deborah and told her that he had a vivid dream about being yanked out of bed and having to resist, only to wake up and find himself out of bed with red rub marks and blisters around his wrists. In February 1994, the Pickmans bought a new TV and, of course, lost the remote. As Tony was looking for the remote, he felt someone tap him on the shoulder, and then he heard a woman's voice say, Tony, here is your remote. Surprised, Tony accused Deborah of playing a trick, only to realize that Deborah had not even been in the room. Was this second spirit a full-grown woman? A few days later, while sitting at the table with George and some friends, Tony would begin to feel as if a bug or something was buzzing around his head. Eventually, the others noticed blood on Tony's forehead and several deep scratches on his scalp. Tony insisted that he never even felt being cut. They also witnessed a flaming pacifier get tossed underneath the table. About a week later, Tony had fallen asleep on the couch. He felt a cool breeze overtake him, and when he woke up, he felt heavy and trapped, like something was pushing on him. He was unable to move for a time. Whatever this entity was, it did not seem to be the same Sally that they had gotten used to. They again reached out to Barbara, who confirmed that they did now in fact have two separate entities in the house. The photos indicated to Barbara that there was some kind of animosity or conflict between the entities, but it wasn't directed at the Pickmans. Barbara sensed that the second entity was someone close to Sally, perhaps a caretaker or even her mother, and she wanted Sally to move on with them. But Sally was stubborn and refused. Things quieted down for a bit, until June 1994, when activity again became more common. Music boxes would play continuously with no outside help. Baby Taylor was back to being woken up from his sleep, and now afraid of some of his toys to boot. One day, during Taylor's nap time, Deborah saw what could best be described as a classic orb hovering around her staircase. It stopped for a bit, and then it darted off. Deborah assumed that all these new problems must be the result of the new female spirit, so she appealed to Sally for help, and the disturbances did stop for a time after that. But then on July 9th, 1994, Tony went to bed in the master bedroom after getting home from work. Deborah went into the nursery to play with Taylor for a bit when she heard one of the toys make a strange screeching sound. It was a noise-activated toy designed to play back the sounds of the baby but it shouldn't have picked up anything as they were playing quietly. Whatever the sound was, it didn't seem like just noise, though it didn't seem to be a human voice either. Just then, the phone rang. Deborah went downstairs to answer it, and after a short conversation, she hung up and went back upstairs. But before making it back to the top, she heard Tony quietly calling to her in a strained voice. Tony was sprawled out on the bed and he looked terrified. Tony described trying to fall asleep. Watching small dust particles in the light of the window, he noticed they seemed to be congregating. The waterbed began to gently move up and down, becoming more and more violent and eventually tossing him in the air. The dust continued to group until it formed the torso of a woman with long black hair and a black lace outfit who hovered over him. She did not have a pleasant expression on her face either. Tony became unable to move, and unable to call out for help. As the entity approached, he could hear it speak, but he couldn't make out all the words. He struggled to leave the bed and make for the door. Then suddenly the woman vanished, and he collapsed back into the bed. Eventually, the Pickman story at the now infamous Sally House would become known well outside the small town of Atchison. It attracted the likes of the TV show Sightings, ran by Linda Moulton Howe as well as similar paranormal-themed shows from the likes of the Discovery Channel and the Travel Channel. I won't get into the content of those shows here, 
but I will link to them over at lorenlegends.net along with other references. Instead, I'm going to jump ahead to after all the TV drama, to an attempt to purge the spirits from the house. Barely after the dust had settled with the TV crew, a self-proclaimed shaman showed up and offered to help cleanse the house, claiming she had assistance on the other side that could help move the entities on to a more proper afterlife. Ready to turn the page, the Pikmins agreed. When the time came, the shaman came in full ceremonial garb. They could feel the atmosphere in the house grow heavy, possibly as the entities of Sally and the woman sensed what would happen. The lights were turned out, and a single candle was lit. The shaman went about the house, burning sage, which was used to soften the spirits. They sat around the candle, and meditated and prayed, until the shaman sensed the presence of a male spirit that they had not even been aware of, as well as the spirit of a woman who was hiding from the shaman, and not long after that, the spirit of a young girl in the nursery. But Deborah and Tony couldn't quite part with Sally, though the unknown male spirit and the woman needed to go. The male spirit went willingly, though didn't understand why. The woman spirit that had perhaps been responsible for the more terrifying events, was stubborn. And as the shaman worked to rid the house of her, Tony could feel the scratching of his back. The female entity did not like Tony, and did not want to leave. Eventually, though, Tony's pain subsided, and the shaman confirmed that the spirit had moved on. After this, Sally's interactions became fewer and farther between, and eventually the Pikmins did move from the house. The Sally House still stands in Atchison, Kansas, and you can take tours of the house, or, if you're bold enough, you can even stay the night. Guests still report strange occurrences from time to time, which can include things like electronics failures, mysterious cold drafts out of nowhere, and even invisible touches. Does the ghost of a young girl named Sally still linger in the house that she became attached to for whatever reason? Do you believe in ghosts at all? Or are ghosts really just something far more sinister, like a demon, slowly trying to lure you into complacency and letting it in through whatever means necessary? The latter is one opinion shared by Tony Pickman, who believes the demonic forces often appear to you as what you want to see. In this case, Deborah had wanted a little girl when she was first pregnant, and for a long time she had even wanted to see a ghost. And that innocent little ghost ultimately escalated into something physically violent. For my opinion on ghosts and demons in this context, you'll have to click that link in the episode description to lorenlegends.net. As for the evidence of this haunting, many of the photographs that were mentioned as being taken throughout this story do in fact exist and can be found in one place or another. They include the strange ghostly blobs and shadows, pictures of Tony's injuries and of the stuffed animals that seem to move on their own, as well as photos of the nursery as it was in 1993. And there are a lot more incidents in between these sort of main events that I covered in this podcast. Links to the TV shows, books, and websites that cover all of these things will be posted at loreandlegends.net. If you liked this episode, consider leaving me a tip by going to buymeacoffee.com slash loreandlegends. And be sure to click subscribe, leave me a good review, and share one of your favorite episodes with someone who you think might be interested. But that's all for this episode. See you next time. Thanks for checking out Lore and Legends. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with your friends. You could also support the show at buymeacoffee.com slash loreandlegends. You can follow the show on Instagram, where my handle is loreandlegends1, or on Twitter, at loreandlegends3. You can also subscribe to the Lore and Legends YouTube channel, and of course, loreandlegends.net, for more show-related content and show notes.